basically, you know, you can divide the entire blockchain growth into two areas. One is the crypto related and another is the business blockchain. The crypto related areas are growing slowly, you know, because there are some regulatory hurdles, you know, which are getting resolved by the government of India now. And we are seeing the growth in this ecosystem a bit cautiously, but it is happening now. So crypto exchanges are generating good volumes in 2023. Uh, you know, the workforce that we are building from colleges and universities have a lot of blockchain uh, uh, expertise now. Earlier, it was very difficult to get the blockchain expert students or professionals from the market. Now, that's not the case. Uh, similarly, you know, the crypto related products, also a lot of startups are coming from India. I think there are more than 300 companies which are working in this direction, uh, specifically in India. As far as uh, business blockchains are concerned or the blockchain for the enterprise are concerned, that is something which is booming a lot in India. SDFC is doing a project, ES Bank is doing a project for, uh, you know, settling of the funds abroad. Uh, similarly, in supply chains, you can see uh, many companies you know, starting from the smaller companies uh, like, you know, Killer Jeans uh, to the bigger companies like, you know, Geo. Everyone is trying to create an ecosystem where they can include traceability in their end-to-end -end products using blockchain. So supply chain is something where, you know, you are seeing a lot of adoption in India. Agri-tech companies are there. You know, I work with a startup that is doing traceability of agri, agri, agri products. So now you can trace your vegetable or fruit from, foam, uh, from farm till fork. So those kind of ecosystems are uh, developing very, very fast. Uh, similarly, your decentralized ID or, you know, ID on blockchain. This is something that uh, even IITs are working, you know, along with Aadhaar and other kind of projects. Healthcare domain projects are coming. You know, Apollo has started uh, a first project where they are putting all their data on blockchain healthcare, which has a humongous potential. So the business blockchain growth in India is taking a, a lot of pace and adoption. The crypto is, is slightly delayed from, you know, the other parts of the world. So we are currently at seventh rank across the world. But I think this year, once the entire guidelines and the legal framework is made and done, I think we will see the similar growth in the uh, crypto space as well. Thanks. You know, I think this is helpful. Uh, so we're seeing crypto already uh, making ways into finance, supply chain. So let's take this to Avinash. So Avinash, based on your experience at uh, Clear, how are you seeing business being transformed or a significant value is being generated using AI, crypto, and blockchain? Yeah, so, um, you know, um, ClearTax, um, you know, serves both customers and enterprises. So what we are seeing, right, um, there's one set of technologies, which is like AI, um, um, which is far ahead of adoption curve. Like, it's very difficult or... Uh, or it's becoming increasingly difficult for businesses to adopt to AI because the technology is there. It's just how do we adopt and how fast can we adopt? And there are technologies like blockchain, metaverse, NFTs. Um, these technologies are like, uh, um, you know, the, the technology is still not as scalable or is still not there where common use cases or common businesses can adopt to them easily. So we are seeing these two different you know, bipolar world, where one technology is far ahead and uh, there's other technology which is still lagging behind and businesses are trying to adopt, but it's, it's still not there yet. And, uh, th and you know, in you know, common use cases, like, you know, f for example, in our own company, um, uh, AI has transformed a lot. Like, you know, we are trying to adopt AI into marketing. There are video campaigns that can be personalized to each user. Um, and, uh, you know, there's operations that can be built on chat GPT. So a lot of transformation is happening and we are like running behind the block to adopt to them. There's, there's also a lot of new use cases that are getting unblocked, you know, like we are also someone who sell mutual funds and like 50% of our customers come and ask like, you know, can you please recommend me what sort of portfolio of mutual funds should I have? And when you are discussing something as discrete and as customized to every user, it's, there's, there's no construct that you can give it to, uh, which, is, which can be adopted to everyone. And with AI and uh, GPT and some of these models, you can build a good framework and a good construct that can be personalized to many, you know, probably a million users. So 
um, so yeah, so a lot of businesses are sort of uh, trying to haggle between the two worlds and um, my sense is that a lot of businesses would try to move faster towards AI because the technology is far ahead. And blockchain, I think, once it catches up, people will look into it, but businesses have started looking into blockchain and um, it, it's still not there yet for adoption. Got it. So there's a good start, but still there is some way to go. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. So let's now take it to Kamesh on the meta side, on the metaverse side. Uh, what's the road ahead for metaverse? We all have seen the hype curve about a couple of years back or at least an year back on this. So, and how do you see NFTs and other digital collectibles getting adopted, especially in India? Yeah, so, I can give uh, so some examples. Unfortunately, we don't see any kind of uh, blockchain adoption happening uh, <laughs> other than crypto, to be frank, right? So, if you take example of biggest metaverse like Sandbox, right? So, where there is a token business which is going on, this, they have a billion dollar market cap and everything. If you see the actual you know, users who are really spending time and efficiently using it, which is highly questionable. Right now, what I see in the last five years, I always used to watch any interesting use case which can get out uh, from, a, from crypto. It's not actually. So we were all talking about blockchain. All the billion dollar companies are trying to pilot something on blockchain. But uh, the money and finance and entrepreneurs can make money as well as VCs want to invest everything around, revolving around cryptos. Unfortunately, if you say that I'm really solving some purpose in a real world through blockchain and obviously using this technology, no one cares. So, right, in a VC point of view as well as the adoption point of view, it's all about the tokens as of now. So, I would say the, the metaverse, I would, I would say gaming is something is really natural towards adapting to so NFT. Why? Because of uh, people already buying $200 billion worth of in-game assets already through Play Stores. Unfortunately, whatever you buy through Play Stores right now, you can't retrade or you can't rent this NFTs, right? So, because there is no concept of NFTs in Play Store, right? So, imagine if we able to convert every digital uh, gaming asset that we can convert as NFTs, so people can buy the guns or dresses and skin, and then if they, after playing the game, they feel boring, and then they can re even easily retrade it or you can put it for rental. There is another use case that we can generate around that. So what I see, the world is moving towards that, because which is na quite natural, because pe it is not new, right? People all already, there is a big industry, people buying in-game assets for fun. Like it's like watching movie for an older generation. But right now for the younger generation, it's all about just buying out the new game for 5,000, 10,000 rupees and just playing it for fun, right? Which is there. So I feel like this younger generation naturally adapts towards the NFTs and retrading and everything. You can see this Web2 world, there is a biggest uh, uh, gaming marketplace called Steam, which do billions of trade volume like Binance, uh, right? All the uh, uh, young kids are uh, used to buy the gaming assets and trade it for fun, right? I can see that is one gun which cost $160,000 just for the fun. This young kids are just buying a gun worth of $160,000. They can't retrade. They can only retrade inside the marketplace. They can't remove that asset to the different game or move the asset to the different game. They can't put it for rental. So, but still people were spending money for it, right? So, because for them it's so important because their entire friends and family and the community of all, everyone sitting on Discord and chatting about the game and then they want to showcase things, right? How we used to buy Rolls Royce and Rolex watches and everything. For the new generation, it's all about gaming, right? They want to showcase things, how they play well in the game, what kind of premium assets they have, and they, if there is an opportunity uh, because of the NFTs, they can retrade. Naturally, we see there's a huge, uh, you know, in the three, four years, we're able to see there'll be a huge spike for NFTs and gaming. So if you can say the gaming is part of metaverse, right? So metaverse is nothing but, uh, I would say, it's gaming. The biggest metaverse right now is going to be roadblocks, but it's a centralized metaverse, right? So where I feel like, you know, naturally this in a metaverse culture is already there. People are spending time inside the game, right? So I feel that is something we don't want to define metaverse like sandbox. I, I feel like every games are more going to be metaverse, right? If you're able to move the assets from the game, uh, then it's going to be metaverse. So that is a very, see, that is a huge opportunity. And, and is, for example, we recently did something with Flipkart, right? We're just moving, you know, we're powering the entire technology for Flipkart, where they're trying to retrade their loyalty points as NFTs. Right, they, they hold close to half a billion worth of loyalty points inside there. You know, everyone have a super coins and everything, right? Imagine like you can trade the super coins, right? Those kind of you know, use cases we are experimenting with them. 
we already just launched a soft launch and we able to generate 1.1 million wallets. So the, it clearly shows that is adoption. No one cares about crypto, right? When it's come to, you know, if some way if you're able to get a discounts through Flipkart, right? You already own cash back. You, you don't know how to use it, right? If you can retrade that, any kind of technology is fine for the people. So that is what I'd say. No, that's very interesting. NFTs, collectibles, gaming. Uh, but I think on the blockchain and crypto, let's let's hear from the next round what panelists have to say about the challenges and adoption. But moving on to Varun, uh, so Varun, see, we, we heard about the potential of all these technologies there. Uh, what, according to you, should be the policies or the policy frameworks to ensure that the adoption increases and people move ahead without much of an issues on this? Yeah. So, uh, Rajat, I have good news to tell. Okay, the good news is, if you talk about adoption, it's happening. And it's happening in India, in public sector. You know, we all crib about government not coming up with policies, government not doing this. All of that is towards the financial aspect of, of tokens that we call it, which is crypto. But if you look at the underlying technology of decentralization blockchain, the maximum and the biggest case studies that exist in India are, are in Indian in public sector, whether it's land records, whether it's Digi Yatra, by the way, it's my favorite app. <laughs> or, you know, uh, so, so I think one thing that I would like to ask every time we discuss this is, what is the problem we are trying to solve? And that also leads to your first question. Yeah. It's not whether AI is solving the problem or blockchain is solving, it, it's a problem. Yeah. And that solution needs all technologies to come together. Yeah. So that's one. As far as the regulatory framework is concerned, look, the short answer is nobody has figured it out yet, anywhere in the world, right? The, the, the difference is in approach. Some countries have approached it in a more liberal way. Some countries, including our government, is conservative because um, we all know, right? Uh, there's a lot of speculation involved in this, right? And we have a large population who does not understand the technicals of crypto, they would just buy crypto because they saw somebody in YouTube and said, oh, this will go up 100%. So 99% of the cases in retail sector are like that. But if you really look at it from a government and regulatory aspect, nobody has figured it out yet. Nobody has a concrete law. These things happen in iterations. Even if you look at the financial systems that exist today, banking, they were built in iterations over decades and decades, right? So it will take time for the regulatory framework to evolve. I think one area which will really accelerate this is, is uh, uh, forensics. See, today the biggest challenge government, I, I was talking to some of you before the session, the two words that all governments globally are worried about and they're scared. One is censorship freedom. It's not about uh, it's not about, uh, this is, this word reflects the mindset of the person. They don't want to be controlled, right? And which is dangerous in some cases, that it is not dangerous, but censorship freedom is a problem. And that when it coupled with anonymity, which is again big, this is what governments are very, very scared of. And the way these things can be managed and governments can be, they, they feel more comfortable when they will have the right technology to do forensics. I think that is, and forensics at scale, if it has to happen in India, because we know <laughs> every guy at the corner is, is buying crypto and selling crypto and, you know. So, so uh, this is one area which needs improvement. The second is, I think the technology itself is yet to mature. So if you look at Web3 stack, there are a lot of white spaces which are yet to be created, right? There are people who are working on it. But it's not there yet. Right? So I think that is a second piece. Third piece is we have to understand fundamentally this technology was not created for one organization. This technology was created for ecosystems, right? for solving industry level problems. So applying this to solve those kind of problems where two competitors have to come together to solve it. I think those are the use cases which are waiting to be discovered. 
right? Traditionally, enterprises are very control savvy. They want to have control over IP. They want to have control over service. They want to control it, right? I think that mindset is evolving as we speak slowly and slowly, and people understand that it's important for an ecosystem to succeed, that you have trust in this ecosystem, and that comes when you don't have a control and you have a governance. So most of these chains that you see are run by foundations. Mm. They're not run by dot coms and, yeah. you know, they're mostly foundations. So these are things that are being developed as we speak. So is, are these the only hindrance? Do you see talent also as one of the hindrance, or at least uh, holding us from, uh, uh, from where we should be? See, talent in blockchain is simple, remote. <laughs> I think, I, I love that word, right? Because this is our gift as blockchain developers to the, to the IT industry, remote. Right? Other places you want to be physically co-located in an ODC as we call it in IT industry, right? Here, it is impossible to find 15 developers in Delhi. It is impossible. So you need so to leverage up from your a development talent. point of view, but from the consumption point of view, the people using that, are they trained enough right now or do you need so post training? Some this? of the best implementations of technology are when the technology is not visible. Use Digiyatra. Yeah. I'm a big fan. Yeah. Again. WhatsApp, but yeah. unless you go into the FAQs of that app, you will not know that it runs on blockchain and it is using verifiable credentials. I am very passionate about it because I myself run Dice ID, which is our product of verifiable credentials. And we are creating the largest ecosystem uh, of talent in India. But coming back to the point, uh, Rajat, it should not be visible to users. Mm -hmm. It should be about solving the problem and user experience. Correct. Right? Isn't it? Yeah. Nobody had a change management for WhatsApp. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that is the fundamental thing when there is a lot of friction in Web3 because the way you log in into an app is very different the way you log in into a Web3. You have to attach your wallet True. and that comes with its own risks, right? So I think these are the things which are getting solved. Um, mobile enablement of Web3 apps is another area which is getting solved as we speak. Good. So let's build on, the, on that, Kamesh, with you. Uh, so from Metaverse perspective, what are the key success factors which will solve some of these challenges and improve adoption? Right now, I would say uh, experience of the game, right? You, you can't find experience of roadblocks in any of the Web3 games as of now. Most of the Web3 games are more like DeFi-based games. Just people used to play the games just, just to make coins, right? So th there is no real interest or addiction in the gameplay, right? That needs to be changed. So that's why I, I can see the next boom is going to be on AAA games getting into Web3. So that is something, you know, because every six month or every Bitcoin halving cycle, which we used to figure out a new trends, right? The last trend was into more like Unisap kind of exchanges, DeFi boom, all this kind of things happen. It is not in 2018, it is on to after 2020, it's all happened. The next boom is going to be on the gaming, I would say. So the, right now the gaming, quality of the game, the experience of the game really sucks. So the only way to change huge adoption and everything is so if you have a good game, as he was rightly telling, that you know people should not even feel the uh, chains or blockchain. It, it should be seamless to them. So that's where we're able to get more adoption. And then like fiat payment gateways and everything which really getting day by day mature now. When governments also started supporting for fiat payment gateways, we can see you can buy cryptos on Zepay using your UPI or credit cards, right? So which is the facility that we were able to see evolving for a period of time. So getting fiat payment gateway and then like, you know, having better use user experience other than MetaMask and then like, you know, good quality of the games. All these kind of things will have a bigger adoption and more users will get into the As of now, which is not available. We take the biggest metaverses right now, whatever we're speaking in the Web3 world, if you, you can't spend more than 20 minutes into that. It will feel so boring after 20 minutes. So that is the way, but the coins can be traded on billions, but unfortunately, if the real users will not have a good experience for some time, but that is a, a, that is the way even internet. In the initial days, right, if you want to see your mark and everything, it takes, you know, 30 minutes and everything to get your results, right? So those were the days, but right now it is on the mobile. I think this evolution will happen. So I'm able to feel it because I'm last month I was in LA, I'm able to see more than 25, 30 plus game, all triple A rated games are getting into, you know, uh, uh, and NFTs and Web3. So, which is a good positive sign. Like the top studios are getting into that. 
So top uh, AAA studios are exploring metaverses and all these kind of things. We'll have a, I think naturally in the next one year is we are able to see a lot of adoption towards the gaming metaverse and Web3 because of the quality of the games. So the user experience which is driving uh, the adoption and we see the value being realized in subsequent years for, uh, to come. So let's build on top of that, uh, uh, Avinash. So at ClearTex, uh, how have you seen uh, your organization demystifying these technologies and and bring a more uh, business lens or, or improve the overall business operations there? Um, <clears throat> so one thing, uh, uh, you know, what we observed while demystifying this is um, some of these technologies that are com coming off uh, this age are from a completely different universe. It's It's not something that is easily adaptable, uh, you know. Um, um, you, it, it, I think it's echoing. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult for engineers to sort of suddenly adapt into, you know, people who have been coding in Java, Python, to suddenly adapt into Solidity Rust. It's very difficult for marketers to communicate effectively about crypto technologies, you know, we had to even change our PR agency because our existing PR agency didn't know how to effectively communicate, um, you know, uh, crypto taxation and things like that. You know, so the uh, 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 it's it's challenge for most of these organizations to demystify this, and it is another challenge to actually make it work into an effective business model. Um, there's this analogy, you know, like. Uh, uh, three years, you know, long back, uh, I had, um, I, I was stationed in Brazil, and um, I, I lived there for three years. Um, Brazilians generally follow football and probably uh, F1, uh, but if you show them any sport, you know, you generally show them basketball, you show them American football, rugby, they don't play rugby, but if you show them rugby, they probably in 15 minutes get what the game is. You show them cricket for two hours, they don't get a clue what it is. Nobody gets a clue what cricket is. And except probably the subcontinent and a few commonwealth countries, nobody understands what cricket is or naturally gets what it is. It is a challenge for them. And these, some of these technologies I sort of, uh, is analogous to cricket. It's, if you are in it, you understand what to do. If you are outside of it, it is very difficult to adopt. And it's as if there's a Chinese wall between and you have to, cross it to understand what the other technology is. So like Anuj and uh, Varun were saying, um, it's very difficult to get developers in these technologies. And so you, you, you people, I mean, you know, it, it's, it'll be transformational as ecosystem to start getting people, developers, marketeers, uh, operation executives to start understanding that technology and support the businesses effectively. So yeah, it's, it's challenging uh, for existing business to suddenly adopt to this, and um, yeah, so because the learning curve is very steep. Yeah. Well, you want to add something before I come to Anuj? Yeah, yeah very quickly. Um, you have to look at blockchain talent from two perspectives. There's further segmentation. Uh, one is developers who integrate blockchain into the apps. That ecosystem is developing, right? Uh, the the integration with Ethereum, Polygon, is an SDK integration. So pe people are able to learn and they are able to do it. But writing the contracts is difficult, right? If you want to uh, use, say, Polkadot to construct a blockchain uh, assembly, is, is, is that talent is difficult to get. Just wanted to bring that. Interesting, good. So, so uh, just to add on this thing, um, um, since uh, we, we talked about adoption and all, see, uh, I agree to the point that uh, any technology which is for the consumer side is should be like almost invisible you are doing a facial recognition do you know that there's a lot of ai tech behind this thing uh, if you are um, you know you might have used or everyone over here must have used dnd services you know this is uh, all done on a blockchain layer between telecoms so technology is there to solve the back end problem for it Correct. and make people life easier right. and that is where Many people are not even aware that they are on the blockchain indirectly. They are using this technology, but they are they are just uh, you know uh, uh, because of the ease which our larger enterprises have put years to uh, you know bring in. They are they are you know uh, unaware that it's a tech game at the end. Where now if a DND would happen for a one market at one telecom, it will be there for all the telecoms, and you cannot 
really uh, go uh, beyond that wall. Right. So, so a lot of things are happening. Governments have came in in this particular sector. Health ID. So, uh, health related data. Aims have uh, floated, uh, you know, tenders and everything, uh, where they want all their health data to be, you know, kind of put uh, to encryption level all over the blockchain thing itself. So, it's a more enterprise uh, game, so that users' life can be made easy. True. and user experience remain unchanged for all the people around and and that is where the people are you know uh, targeting and focusing on got it no i think that's that's that makes sense and uh, so let me bring back to anuj uh, so yes yeah so let me just bring back to you anuj uh, very quickly uh, so uh, based on this i mean what fundamental shifts do you have to see we hear that uh, it's uh, we should not be aware that what kind of a tech is being used behind but what fundamental shifts that organizations needs to have to bring all this to the business part? We see on a consumer side, there's already there. But from a business, that typical traditional supply chain, typical finance, how do you make value and money out of that by using these techs? So for of course, you can counter the uh, <coughs> blockchain adoption, yeah, yeah. <laughs> crypto adoption part as well. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, most of the blockchain adoption is invisible, uh, like, you know, as Varun also said, because under the hood, what technology is getting used is not known to us. But, uh, you know, I'll still hold to the point that, you know, this sector is growing by 80%, and even in India, it's growing even higher, uh, especially the business blockchain. Um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the challenges for the organizations are concerned, you know, it, it, it starts from assessing the need of a blockchain itself. You know, earlier it was very difficult for blockchain companies to con convince the client that it is actually the requirement. Now we have established uh, decision trees by which, you know, if you, if you traverse through those decision trees, you can at least come to know that, you know, you need a blockchain. There is a problem of trust, you need a distributed ledger, there is a problem of consensus, you can't do it with a third party agreement and all. So at least the first level is now very, very clear that you know uh, you can convince a corporate that uh, a blockchain technology is needed in their organization. The second, uh, uh, the second issue that you know we generally face whenever we start working with any client in, in the blockchain space is how do we interoperate with their existing IT systems? Because that is also very, very complex in nature. You know, creating a blockchain architecture and integrating it with the current technology stack. Blockchain uh, has a completely different way of designing the thing. It's a distributed architecture. You have nodes. You have application running on different, different points. You cannot develop an application from scratch for an organization. You generally have to integrate with their ERP, SAPs, or, you know, any other uh, legacy systems that they are using. So how do you create an architecture? How do you bring the data and, you know, take the data forth and back from uh, those? And how do you put it in a ledger? How do you basically sync up the databases of those two organizations together? That's another major challenge, you know, whenever you start designing the blockchain applications for the enterprises. And normally when you design a blockchain application, uh, it's not only one organization that become parts of it. You generally have to bring many organizations that works in that ecosystem uh, become the part of it. Because essentially what you want to solve is a problem of trust and the problem of trust exists between multiple entities. So it's not only about, you know, I, ca I convince Reliance that, okay, I want to win a blockchain, but you know, you have to convince the entire ecosystem, ecosystem. which works around uh, Reliance uh, uh, to have a blockchain adoption. No, this is helpful. So let me just uh, take a final question, uh, Saurabh, to you. So Saurabh, see what, and I think uh, it's in public news that in APAC there is a, some uh, funding that comes approximately of 140 billion. And China takes up a huge chunk of that. And India is, uh, I think, at least one-fourth or one-fifth of what that funding is. Where are we lacking? What is that uh, problem that, uh, where are we struggling that this kind of a huge fund goes to our neighbor? And what's, what's the problem here? What, what are we lacking here? So, uh, Rajat, uh, if you would see uh, when it comes to enterprises, startups, building the tech, on the blockchain or metaverse or AI, uh, there are a lot happening in the space. Um, I can, uh, you know, give you a count on uh, fingers. Like there are at least 35, 40 different companies who are trying to shape or you know change the paradigm of how we interchange data, how the interoperability uh, works. There's a company called Mudrex which works on crypto as a service. Uh, they're putting up the entire exchange 
to uh, custody and everything in one stack and a lot of other things uh, uh, all together. Then there's a company which is uh, doing like a rupee card. So they are using the regular rupee cards and then they are giving the benefits of a crypto and a digital gold over the card itself. So user would have that ease because it's already pre-created wallet in the rupee card and you know they are kind of leveraging on it. Government is helping them out. Uh, it's not like the st uh, startups and the tech enterprises are not there working in the d direction for India. It's just the other side of the mindset where VC sits there, they want a second validation coming from Western world or from somewhere outside uh, the country as a, as a proven or a, a use case, as a proven market uh, where they would see that, okay, Indian market shall be also uh, uh, you know, adopting it. It's also a mindset, uh, uh, again, that uh, uh, Indian consumers are not smart enough. But uh, I, I would really contradict on this. We have a larger IQ than most of the Western worlds uh, in general or in, in average. So it's, it's just a certain mindset because we have sh uh, seen the shifts from e-commerce to D2C. Now it will be a pure tech play for an, another coming uh, you know, half a decade. Okay. You will see a lot of investments coming or routing to India because of, you know, now, uh, again, governance play and other things will matter a lot in that particular thing because investing in India is always difficult. Uh, people take out the funds set up in UAE, Singapore, other free zones uh, outside the uh, India, and that's where Indian founders are working, Indian founders running entities out of the India and uh, operating in India, uh, uh, I mean, so putting their team over here, putting the fund uh, outside India itself. So, so it's just that the mindset has to change to a, to a larger extent to uh, enable that thing. A uh, lot of things are happening in India when it comes to uh, you know, this uh, amalgamation of tech.